Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today for NWHM Presents Lessons in Leadership. My name is Emma, and I am the Associate Educator of Digital Learning and Innovation at the National Women's History Museum, and I will be your host today. A few housekeeping notes. Our panelists will be answering questions at the end of our conversation. You are welcome to ask your questions at any time during the program by using the Q&A function on your toolbar. You may ask your questions at any time during the presentation, but we will primarily be answering them at the end of the program. We are so excited and happy to answer your questions, so please use the Q&A, and you can also um, let us know what you're thinking via chat throughout the presentation. And with that, I would like to introduce today's moderator. So Wendy Doyle is president and CEO of United We. During her 10-year te uh, tenure, tenure my, my apologies, at United We, Wendy has led the organization to invest in research, advocacy, and policy solutions to remove economic barriers for women, including conducting 26 meaningful research studies, advocating for issues resulting in 54 policy actions, and supporting more than 190 plus women in securing civic appointments. Uh, Wendy advocates for reforms and honors the legacy of women and contributes to policy solutions that advance equal pay, paid family leave, affordable childcare, and occupational licensing, among others. So, Wendy, thank you so much for serving as our moderator today. We are so excited for this conversation. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Emma. It's great to be here and with this incredible group of panelists, these esteemed women. And just to frame a little bit before I introduce our panelists today, we the topic of this is really to create a conversation about obstacles and opportunities facing women mayors. Um, as we know in the political world, women have made significant strides and we have much to celebrate. However, in 2023, there are still so many cities across the United States that have never elected a woman to serve as mayor. So while every candidate and mayor's experience in the process are different, there still continues to be enormous gender-based barriers that exist. The 1887 election of Susanna Salter, America's and the world's first woman elected mayor um, in the state of Kansas who served continues to shed light on today's process media representation, campaigning, resistance, and success of women in local politics. So with that framing, we are going to have an engaging conversation. And as Emma said, please, throughout the conversation, drop your questions in the Q&A. With that, I'm going to, be, to begin by introducing our first panelist, Karen M. Greenwald. Karen is an award-winning children's author. Her book, A Vote for Susanna, The First Woman Mayor, was named a Kansas 2022 notable book. Kansas chose to represent the state at the Library of Congress National Book Festival and in the Library of Congress's Great Reads from Great Places initiative. Her book, her next book, which I'm super excited, Karen, um, is the mud, called The Mud Angels, How Students Saved the City of Florence. Can't wait for that. You can currently pre-order that book. So Karen also um, co-founded the hashtag Sun Right Fun Writing Contest, which raises money for kidlit charities. Her strategic branding efforts have earned 17 international awards. So welcome, Karen. Our next panelist I'd like to introduce is Maddie Parker, and Maddie is the 45th mayor of Fort Worth, Texas. Since 2021, she has been focused on building a safer, stronger community where families can thrive. Her vision is to build Fort Worth into a world-class city, and Mayor Parker, I know you're well on the way, and welcome. Our next panelist is Diana Smith, and Diana is a former two-term mayor of Seneca Falls and past president of the New York Conference of Mayors. She is a frequent speaker, trainer, and writer, and recognized for inspirational instruction and empowers others to lead. Welcome, Diana. And finally 
is Melina Carnicelli is the first and only woman to date elected mayor of Auburn, New York. Prior to and after eight years at City Hall, she was a public school teacher and administrator. In addition, Melina co-founded a workplace consulting firm specializing in creating respectful workplace environments. Currently, in the effort to achieve gender balance in the United States elected offices across the country, Melina founded First Amendment First Vote, Inc., the nonpartisan civic engagement program for high school teens who identify as girls. Welcome, panelists. I'm super excited to launch into our discussion for today. And the first question is going to be directed to Karen. So Karen, we are all here today thanks to you. This was your vision, your brainchild to pull this group together. How did your years of research and writing this book, as well as speaking to former mayors, inspire you to bring this panel together? And what do you hope comes out of today's discussion? Thank you so much, Wendy, for agreeing to moderate and to all the panelists for joining me today and especially to the National Women's History Museum. I am honored to be back for another important discussion and I can't imagine a better entity to host it. So thank you. Um, very good question, Wendy. <laughs> yes, it was years of research and I started out thinking to myself, because for those of you who don't know, Susanna Salter's election was um, a lightning rod around the world. She was put on the ballot when Kansas passed the first and only law granting women the right to run for office and vote in municipal elections um, as a ruse, as a joke by the city's men that really didn't want women, um, not even running for office, not only voting, but not even in the discussion about the city's future. So they put her name on the ballot and thought when she lost, because of course she would lose, um, they could show everyone in the city, um, nobody wants women involved. And the humiliation would prevent any other women from ever considering running. So the first question to me was, why did she say yes? Her husband was against it. He didn't want her to be humiliated. Um, everything seemed against her. No woman had ever won. Obviously, it was the first time of the law. And um, why? Because if she lost, which it seemed likely, that embarrassment would be generational in a small city. Um, Argonia at the time was under 500 residents. And at last check, I believe it's still um, the same size. And it's not really near anything. Um, no, no major metropolis. And yet somehow out of this small place in the middle of Kansas, this young mother, young woman, um, agreed to run, ran, and won. And it became an international news story. And papers everywhere from South Africa to Italy wrote about her success. And yet still, Nobody in the United States in any of the papers that covered it, and none of the international papers said, why, Ms. Salter, Mayor Salter, why? Why did you run? Why did you say yes? And as a picture book author, you need to have an understanding of your main character's agency, or else there really isn't a story that you can tell. But on a personal level, I was curious. After months and months and months of research, I felt like I knew her as a person. And an incredible opportunity for me was the connection with her family and her incredible granddaughter, a uh, great granddaughter rather, and great grandson shared with me personal letters and ephemera. So reading her personal letters, getting to know her as not only a, you know someone in history, but an actual woman, a mother, a grandmother, I started to understand her more. And still I had to look, why did she say yes? I think what we need to do is move the discussion with women from a place of maybe it's something I could do, maybe I should consider it. We need a paradigm shift. Women need to see themselves as viable candidates and as absolute leaders. And I think if this conversation can open a door to it, if the book can open a door to it, um, picture books are for children but they're also for adults who read the books with their children. 
teachers, educators. And I have hoped this entire time um, that this book would open these sorts of conversations about who is qualified to lead. And big secret, being a woman does not negate you. In fact, I think it's a bonus. Um, so I'd like to have a, a look at that and a, and a conversation starter. And the one thing I will add to this is that I did the normal marketing for a picture book, but I also, in my own right, because I do have a background in politics, I looked at Susanna Salter and the idea of a woman serving in the capacity of mayor as my candidate to run. And so for the last two years, I've been running this campaign of getting women involved. And it introduced me to the amazing women here and several mayors who are women across the country, both serving now and who did previously. And the same comment was made to me with every conversation. I never knew about this. I didn't know this story. Oh my God, this is my story. This is me. One mayor even said, my husband, my daughter, and I read your book and we laughed. And to be honest, as a person who did not write a comedy, um, it was a little bit disconcerting at first. And I said, well, it's not really a comedy. Why did you laugh? She said, because we could not believe with every page how much like my experience this was. And my husband said, take the A off the end of her name. I'm Susan. This is my book. If this means so much to so many women serving in these positions today, it needs to be a broader conversation. So that's why I brought these amazing women together. And this is what I hope it starts, a bigger conversation, a paradigm shift. Thank you, Karen. And maybe someday you may run for mayor um, in your city. You never know. You never know. Thank you for that. Um, the next question is directed to Diana. So Diana, Seneca Falls is often referred to as the birthplace of the women's rights movement after holding the 1848 Women's Rights Convention. It took 156 more years to elect its first mayor, which was you. Will you tell us why you chose to run for elected office? Um, absolutely. I, uh... My story really does, uh, as Karen was talking about, parallel in some ways, um, Mayor Salter's story. I was so excited to meet Karen and to uh, learn about this book. I wish I had known about it when my daughters were little, uh, or wish it was there for me to share with my daughters when they were little, because I didn't have the um, experience uh, that the book really teaches as a lesson until I was almost 40 years old. Um, I have some strong ideas about what leadership is. I think that uh, people have more influence and have uh, capacity to lead or are leaders and don't even know it uh, because I think that leadership is more action as opposed to being an exclusive skill set. Um, if the story of Seneca Falls taught me anything, it's that leadership, especially the kind that affects change, um, can come from really surprising sources. Um, I think leadership is more about having a positive vision for the future and then creating a path to get there, right? And visible leadership means bringing people along with you. Well, some leaders gain followers with compelling language. Some leaders are just magnets and their actions speak louder than words. I didn't recognize that um, doing is leading. And I didn't see myself as a leader until I ran for mayor. Um, I never saw myself running for public office. I let that responsibility go to politicians, people who were cut out for the job, right? Um, and Seneca Falls went through a really ugly and contentious period when I was about 39 years old, uh, right around the, the year 2000, and the community was so divided. So I reluctantly ran, ran and became a trustee in 2001. Well, when the mayor's seat came open, uh, there was a group of us who were actively trying to seat someone who would heal some of the wounds in the community. And there was a fellow trustee, a very nice, very smart, um, and very electable male. Uh, and I was helping him uh, to prepare a campaign to run for mayor. Um, I was helping him because I was more familiar with the issues. 
I was the, the person who tended to do more research. I would brief him before every board meeting and let him know, uh, you know, where things stood. Um, I advised him on his campaign. I was his biggest cheerleader. And as things got more heated, um, he became more and more wary about running. And I kept cheering him on, convincing him that we needed stronger leadership. And suddenly it hit me. Um, it was more work to help him uh, than to just carry the torch myself. So my attitude shifted from not me to why not me? Um, it was simply more logical for me to run. Um, and I think the biggest barrier up until that, up to that point was me. I wasn't expecting that for myself and therefore I just didn't see it as a possibility. There was a lot of head nodding with the panelists um, mm -hmm. as Diana was speaking. So I'm just curious, anything that you're feeling you'd like to add to the conversation, um, Melina? And Melina, you're on mute. Melina, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, Diana, so much of uh, what you said is, uh, is a, a broader experience for so many women, regardless of the leadership role they're in, whether it's in government or other community, uh, community service. So uh, I'm, I'm nodding my head and saying, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the whole notion of uh, women not seeing themselves as leaders. Um, my opinion about that is because for so many decades in this country, we have seen male leaders and we haven't seen the model for, uh, for very long in this country. So now is the time that we're making that difference. And I think it is going to take um, uh, many more decades so that it becomes um, ingrained as a girl's and a woman's rightful place in leadership and governance. So Mayor, Mayor Parker, I know you were, you were nodding too and smiling. So any, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, honestly, Diane and I need to talk offline. There's so many similarities in my own story. Now, I was just elected in 2021 and then again in 2023. Um, Fort Worth, you run every two years. And very much like Diana, I was ready to support another candidate. I had been chief of staff for our former mayor who was retiring, and I was the policy expert. I knew all the issues. I knew what our city was facing and very similar to her own community in Fort Worth. It was um, right after January 6th when I had to decide to run. The country was divided and still is. Our city felt that way, too. And I've been a very vocal proponent for maintaining a lack of partisanship in local government as much as possible, because I think we build consensus and work together. And that's what actually makes cities successful. And so much like Diana, you know, finally had to ask the cell, ask my question. I was trying to recruit somebody else to run when he dropped out and then had to kind of look inward and say, why not me? And all the all the things that we'll talk about today are the reason why you question yourself, right? Especially as a mom and and a, a female in this environment we're in politically. But I I do find so much um, inspiration for women like Melina and Diana who have walked the path before me, um, when arguably it was ten times more difficult, right? And um, and I I get to operate in this space now. Um, very proudly as a as a as a woman mayor, we need more of them, which is why we're talking today, right? But um, I do feel like we're in the right direction. So, Mayor Parker, the next question is for you. Um, and for our audience, you know, we hope that we are inspiring and empowering them to want to raise their hand and do what the, all of you have done. Um, you are one of the youngest mayors of a major city in the United States history. You have been a trailblazer, and that in its own right is a significant accomplishment. We often hear that young women do not feel they have the credentials or experience to run for office. So what would you tell our younger audience? What would you tell them about if they are even thinking about this, about running for elected office? I think I approach this question, Wendy, from two different perspectives. And to be really honest, and I've done this locally with, with individuals, women that are interested in running for office or just being in leadership roles that for me personally in the last two and a half years, first of all, my husband is amazing and an incredible support system. My family, my mom lives with us during the week. 
my kids have really risen to the occasion. It is very hard, um, especially in a growing city like Fort Worth. You're constantly in the spotlight and protecting your family to the extent you can, um, both from physical threat, which is a reality we have to face as a city, um, as city leaders, but just from the little things. You know, I have a 12-year-old who's almost 13 and social media and all those questions, right? So being really vulnerable and honest with anybody that's willing to run is your whole family has to be ready to embark on this journey together um, and recognizing that there are going to be days when your children in particular love it and think it's awesome. And there's going to be another day they're really bitter about it. And they they question, why are we doing this in the first place? And But I do find inspiration. I just had this conversation with my 12-year-old on the way to school the other day about, you know, what do you really think about me being mayor? And he just said, mom, I think it's awesome. You know, you're you're doing all these great things for the city that we love and you're making it better. And that to me is worth everything. When it comes to inspiring women in particular, we know this is true. I think the statistic is you have to ask a woman to do something like this six or seven times. I was no different than that, frankly, when this idea came about for me to decide to potentially put my name in the hat to run. I got all the criticisms that women always get, right? You're you're too young. You have young children. Why aren't you home? Which is very stereotypical. I still get that, by the way. Um, and then also those questions of, are you qualified enough? And as women, I think we need to surround ourselves by other people, not just women, that believe in you and can help you overcome that, I think they call it imposter syndrome, whatever that, you know, that that feeling of I'm not enough to do this, this job I'm being asked to do. But now more than ever, we need people and women do an excellent job at this. I mean, I have, I have five colleagues now all together on Council of Women from very different walks of life, political persuasions, races, and we can get stuff done together. We're willing to look past personal relationships or being gossipy or whatever else and just say, you know what, Dan, I'm going to sit down with you today and we're going to solve this problem and move on. And I want more women to feel like they have a place at the table to do that. And I, I, I am vulnerable about this job in a way that I hope does inspire other people because what you see on television, these, you know, these talking suits and everything's perfection. And there's these images on social media that is not real. I mean, I'm sure Melina and Diana can attest to this. It is messy just to get through the day, especially if you're raising a young family. And so I know my place right now, this is the season in life that we're in. And I, I'm, I am encouraged, as I said before, more and more people are, are starting to wake up and realize, I mean, you know, maybe I do have a place at the table and I want to be of service. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Parker. I think it's so important just for this conversation today, but for all for the leadership and what Diana, Melina, Maddie, all that you've done for young women to be able to see what they could possibly be in the future. So just your leadership alone is is making an impact. So Melina, this question is directed to you um, that speaks to that point. So in 1999, you were the first and so far only woman to be elected mayor in Auburn, New York, which was really the foundation for you to found First Amendment First Vote, which aims to inspire our next and our future generation of civic leaders and candidates for public office. So please tell us about the program and why it's important to help young women imagine themselves in government leadership. Well, there, the basic answer is um, for gender parity in elected office. That's what our vision is for in the program First Amendment, First Vote. And um, just to reiterate what, uh, what Mayor Parker said and what I said previously, we have not had the model for young women, girls, to see themselves as frequently as our boys have in leadership roles, specifically in government. So it's really important uh, for us to, to begin seeing ourselves as models for the future generation. And by the way, for the last five years, First Amendment, First Vote, we're in fabulous hands with the, uh, with the girls who are coming up, uh, coming up and interested in taking these uh, government leadership roles. So the program is really designed to uh, be a pipeline or uh, yes, a pipeline for uh, government service for elected office to achieve gender parity. So the, the as we speak, our Congress right this minute 
is still 78% male and 22% female. So while we have made great strides in the last three uh, presidential election years on all levels of government, we're still woefully underrepresented. In, and that statistic is pretty much across the board. Um, and so we still have a gender gap of 22%. And frankly, when the girls today hear that, we put up a slide and it said, you know, what, what do you suppose is the percentage of gender balance? And most often the first response is, oh, it's half and half. And it's an expectation that the girls already have. And when they hear the reality of it, they're even more interested in how they can uh, move forward on the, on the pathway. Um, and just to kind of underscore what um, Mayor Smith and Mayor Parker have already said, I too, when approached to run for mayor, said no the first time, because I believed, even with all of my uh, professional skills and all of my community involvement, I still believed I needed more uh, instruction, more understanding uh, before I could be uh, before I could be effective. So in fact, I said no to the first approach and but did agree to uh, run for a city council seat. And so I did spend four, four years at City Hall uh, prior to uh, deciding to run for mayor. But I will tell all the women out there that even have an inkling and all the girls out there that have an inkling, as soon as I sat on that city council for about three or four months, I knew I could have done it. <laughs> I knew I could have done it. Uh, but again, there was no model for me in my community. And unfortunately, to this day, there is still no model in my community at, at that uh, leadership level. Um, my election was almost 25 years ago, and I'm still the first and only woman to have been nominated for and uh, won that election. So yes, that did um, compel me to um, found First Amendment First Vote. And uh, we're experiencing quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of success uh, with the girls about, it's always about 80% of the girls um, at, at the end of any cohort, any uh, yearly cohort that says, yes, yes, I can now imagine myself in, uh, in, in a leadership role in government. Whereas I, whereas prior to this, it was not something that I even knew was really, really my rightful place. And um, so they come away with, with understanding that. Thank you. Thank you, Melina. It sounds like, you know, the confidence building that imposter syndrome that Mayor Parker was talking about, you know, that we all as women have often, um, but by sitting on the city council, that really developed the confidence level for you to raise your hand and to run for elected office. And we find, we've done some research actually, quantitative and qualitative at United We, and have found that that is a significant barrier for women's civic engagement. It's just that lack of confidence, and then also just lack of knowledge of how to navigate the process. So it sounds like your program has really taken the mystery out of that and then inspiring and empowering women. So that's fantastic. You know, I think it's so important that we pull our our history of women out of the shadows that they are hidden and which is, you know, a significant role of the National Women's History Museum. Um, you know, our statistics at United We uh, demonstrate that it's about, um, I think, a half of a percent of our United States history is comprised or recognized of women. So we have we know that there's been significant progress. And Karen, we thank you for pulling out of the shadows the first mayor in the world um, by writing the children's book. So as the author of A Vote for Susanna, you have brought to light this incredible story, the world's first mayor. What are some of the most surprising facts you discovered during the research of the book? You know, actually, it's very interesting to me because the fact that she was so internationally known, that's one thing. Um, people wrote thousands of letters to Susanna Salter. Um, weekly, she received them. She actually wrote back to as many as she could on her own dime because as mayor, she earned $1. 
I hope the three of you have earned a significantly higher amount than that. Um, I was unable to find what the males prior to her had earned. I was very curious. Um, for me, when I started working on the book, I saw it as a way to tell a story that sadly nobody had told before to children. And I was very intentional in using a lens of a boy's view of things to tell this story. So many people have said to me, what a great girl power story. This is so good for little girls. But um, I think that that's a problem too in the way we tell stories about women. We don't need to only tell stories to little girls. Here's a great woman that existed 136 years ago. Now you could be just like her. We need to tell all children, not just girls. All children need to grow up with the reality that women have, can, and will do amazing things in our country, in our cities, in the world. So that was one thing that just the reaction I got from people about it was a little surprising. Um, another element for me is that initially I thought, okay, I'm telling this woman's story. And what I mentioned at the start of our discussion that no one had ever talked about her agency. Um, multiple authors wrote me notes and said, I've tried to write this story, one man said, for eight years. I couldn't find a way into the story. Nobody had ever told this story. Um, but what I realized doing my research is that there were two stories that I was learning about. One was Susanna Salter and her amazing performance and bravery. And by the way, she took the city from debt to solvency while mayor. She also, to um, Mayor Parker's point, I, I did not tell this in the book because it's not appropriate for kids, but she was pregnant, gave birth, and the baby died a few months later, all while she was raising other children, helping her husband with his duties, and um, serving as the mayor. Um, but there's another story, and that's the story of the community of Argonia. The men and women of the city, um, in particular men, because not only did she win by a landslide, but it was the men I found who by and large voted her in. Um, what made these men drop their candidate? They were all obviously going to vote for other men. What made them put their political views aside and come together, like Mayor Parker's talked about, come together and do the right thing for their city, ignore their own political opinions, ignore their own issues, um, and do what was right and bullying in their city, not give it a foothold. So for me, I, I feel like it's a bit of um, prologue and in that way as well, and a love letter to those citizens. And the final thing I wanna mention is that the, the, among the things that upset me when I was reading information, I read probably 500 newspapers, maybe more, and paid a lot of attention to the coverage of Susanna Salter. And the things they wrote about her, they actually listed her weight in pounds, her hairstyle, um, the type of mothering she did, her dressmaking skill set, um, if she spoke proper English, what her accent was, her appearance, all externalities. Women are judged by externalities. And the media coverage of her then is no different than the media coverage of women today. How many times have you read, regardless of your political opinions, your, your party, your affiliations, do we need to know that Hillary Clinton wears pantsuits? She has an enormous education. She has a history, whether you agree with her or you don't. She was a viable candidate. And what we know is how much she spent on a haircut and that she wears pantsuits which by the way, women were not allowed to wear until the 1970s in the federal government. Um, another shocking find, I guess, for me. But it's dis disturbing to me that in 136 years, the discussion publicly about women and how they're presented is about what kind of mother they are, what kind of accent, what their weight is and what they look like. Susanna Salter had actually gone to college which is a pretty important detail for a woman in 1887. 
She also studied dressmaking and she studied parliamentary training. She helped her husband with his duties as the clerk for the city. Her father was the first mayor of Argonia. Her husband's father was a lieutenant governor of Kansas previously. She was as qualified as any woman in that city could be for that position. But we know how much she weighed. Thank you, Karen. Diana, the next question um, for you is, at our current rate of progress, it will take another 137 years for women to see gender equity. What institutional and societal change needs to be made for women to be empowered? That's a big question, but. <laughs> it's a huge question. Um, I'll just go back to, I, I think, uh, women need to shift from an attitude of, of not me to why not me. I think it's really, I mean, we've talked a lot about the need for there being models, right? I think it's a self-perpetuating problem um, because I think it is human nature to take cues from our surroundings and behave accordingly, right? Um, thank God in Seneca Falls, women like Elizabeth Kitty Stanton woke up and said, if this is normal, then it's time to change normal. Um, she broke the bubble that was making women, people complacent about equality being only for some. Um, I think it's going to take more women in leadership to change perceptions about leadership. Uh, it's gonna take more women to affect social change. I think not because women are necessarily better at leadership, but because leaders just like people, all people are the sum of their experience. Um, as mayor, uh, I became educated about issues as they occurred, right? As, as, as challenges in the community arose, I would learn about them, uh, understand them, and then respond to them. Um, I think I did not truly appreciate things until they affected me directly. So they had to come before me, right? I think the barriers to women's leadership, um, I think, I think are experienced more by women. So I think men are less likely to champion issues like inequality, reproductive health, um, lack of childcare, family issues, because they're not the ones primarily uh, dealing with those challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not as personal. Um, there's this old joke, and I can't remember who said it, about how, um, if men had babies, there'd be a cure by now. Um, put women in charge, right? Equally. Um, give them an equal voice alongside men. And I think then women's issues will be addressed by leaders who are personally invested. Um, I think all challenges, in fact, would be uh, overcome by the broader perspective. You know, 50% more power, 50% more knowledge. 50% more experience. Think of what we could accomplish as a nation with um, twice the problem solving capacity. So until we achieve that level of equity in leadership um, across all institutions, um, then I think we're going to continue to, um, you know, perpetuate the problem. So we just need to put more women into positions of leadership. And that's why I applaud what Melina's doing. I applaud what Karen's doing. Maddie, thank you for your, your service and for being such a role model. Thank you. Maddie, um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, the toxic political landscape today, and we have polled women in some town hall settings. There is an appetite and interest in running for elected office, but this is an issue. Social media, the, the toxic environment is really holding women back from raising their hand and running for elected office. So any advice, how do, how do you manage this on a day-to-day? -day? Um, because it is such an interesting time. I, I manage it like I think most people would try in my position. You have to ignore most of what you see online to the extent that you can. Sometimes my friends and family um, get real feisty about it and want to defend and get in there and dig. And sometimes that's helpful. Sometimes it's, you know, it's not good for their mental health, probably. I am really worried about it, Wendy. It's not just for women. I'm worried about good people willing to participate in our democracy and run for office because we've let it get out of hand. I mean, I have a, I have an 
quite compiled my policy position yet, but social media companies have a role to play in this. I mean, we've allowed, we've leaned so heavily on the first amendment to allow people to be incredibly toxic online and dangerous in some settings. Women are attacked more often than men. Um, Sexism is absolutely alive and well. Some of the most um, difficult attacks I face usually are from men online and they usually lean on your looks first because they've got nothing else between their ears to lean on. So that's what they like to mention. Um, I, I, but I have chosen rather than just pretend like everything is fine is really be vocal about it because I want to be transparent that this role um, that we're, that I'm in is difficult and other women feel the same way. Um, on From a positive perspective though, I have started to see, and it's interesting you're seeing this in some of your town halls or in your discussions with the public, women are really fed up with the lack of action and policymaking and consensus. And some of these most difficult issues facing our country today, whether it's the debate around gun control or um, abortion or women's reproductive rights, all these issues, women are like over here going, hey, hey, ask me because I actually have more to say on this topic and I'm not being heard. Um, is one thing. One thing I I do feel different than a lot of my other fellow elected leaders. Um, I'm one of the only Republican women serving in local government in the country, and as, especially as a mayor. And while I am very proud and I do not wear my stripes and I'm part, nonpartisan and focus on making sure that's the case, I didn't have an infrastructure there was no she should run group before I you know Joni's a good friend of mine um, and other people that were saying, hey, you know what, you should run for this office because my own party has discouraged women in so many ways. And I, I don't know that I have the capacity or time right now because I'm busy serving my city, but it's something that I'm very passionate about as I move out of this role at some point in the future because we have to change that. You need all voices at the table and you especially have a void right now of women feeling like they're welcome even, especially if they consider themselves a conservative. And that's a bigger issue for us to face. Um, and then lastly, I think when I, when I meet with young girls, especially, and I can see in their eyes, even if they don't agree with every position I've taken or know much about me, there is a power, and I'm sure Melina and Diana have experienced this, when a young girl looks at you and says, man, I could do that. You're the mayor. You're a girl. And I hear that a lot. And say, absolutely. When do you want to be the mayor? And that to me is incredibly empowering because you can only be what you see. And if you don't see yourself and what you're looking at, it makes it very difficult for someone to ever dream that they could be in that position someday. So Mayor, thank you for that. So Mayor Parker, I have um, a follow-up question and, you know, kind of switching on the theme. I've watched you and you've navigated incredibly well of, you know, having a lot of male allies. So your ability to work with both lifting up women, but working with men too. Any advice for our participants today on, on your skills, on any, any, any ideas on how we can do better? Well, I think for me, first of all, women have a really good gut. And if you're a woman in, in, a, le in a leadership position or you've kind of worked your way through, I've had wonderful mentors along the way, men and women, and you need to surround yourself with people you can actually trust that know are in your corner. And I, by having those people, I don't have to worry so much about needing good advice or bouncing things off of someone because I know their, their um, intentions are pure. When it comes to building coalitions, the only way I've been successful and when I'm unsuccessful, I check myself and I realize I wasn't honest in this situation. I wasn't transparent and I wasn't vulnerable because I think, especially in politics today, one thing that women do offer and what we are attracted to is their vulnerability, that not everything is this canned answer, that you don't have this script in front of you, that I'm willing to just tell you my heart and be honest and I'll give you a good example. And this was recently um, a, a gentleman about my age, has a wife about my age. And it's a long story, but essentially I was at an event. And I was like, God, I'm sorry I'm late. I was a hell of a morning, right? I couldn't get my seven-year-old dress. We lost a shoe. Apparently there was a pumpkin due for this contest. I didn't know what the pumpkin. 
And he came up to me. He was like, I wish my wife had been here. Cause we just had this conversation this morning. She had a huge meeting. She was late for, she was feeling major mom guilt because she couldn't go to the school parent meeting. We have to quit that, especially as women and be really vulnerable about where we are in our lives. Because otherwise the Dianas and the Molinas of the world are never going to run because they're like, I have to be perfect. I have to have all my, you know what, together. I'm not going to go run for that office. So I hope that by being vulnerable and and that helps people build a coalition, work with you, realize that you're just a regular person. This is just my job right now, right? That that I'm lucky enough to get to serve in. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Parker, for being real on that. So Melina and, and Diana, just on that point, any advice for our, our participants today? Anything that you've learned along the way about being able to have some male allies and, and working well together with your leadership? Well, well, while I served at uh, City Hall only for a very short time was there the first woman ever to be on City Council. And I served with her for uh, one year, I believe. So for the next six or seven years, I was the only woman uh, in those, in in the decision-making roles for the city. And frankly, I I couldn't get anything done unless I had a majority. So that included uh, my colleagues who were all male uh, at, at that time. And uh, frankly, there's still only one woman <laughs> in city council now. Um, and again, that's 25 years later. But uh, being on being on the job um, for me on my desk, I always had. I always had a running list of what I needed to accomplish, what I wanted to achieve that was for the betterment of the city. I kept this list on my desk, an ongoing list for uh, for all those years. And frankly, um, it wasn't possible to uh, achieve those accomplishments without the coalitions. And and women in leadership are pretty famous for getting to that level because of the uh, ability, communications abilities that are usually uh, well honed and also the uh, camaraderie that's well honed. And what Maddie was talking about, about being upfront, vulnerable, and being frequent, honest communicators is a general attribution that we, uh, that you know, research uh, talks about, about women in leadership. So all of those traits are really what assisted me um, in continuing to develop and get good at over time. But also that's what, um, what propelled me to form those majorities to get the job done. And another point that Maddie made that I just would like to underscore is, um, the ability to work across the aisle and to work with whomever is is dedicated to the goodness of the community and the uplifting of the community, regardless of party affiliation. And frankly, at the lo- local level, in my experience, the party affiliation was only about being nominated and uh, being nominated, uh, frankly. After that, everybody at the local level who is um, really adamant and passionate about the job. It's just about making it a better place to be. Um, And that is regardless of the affiliation and First Amendment, first vote, the basic basic principle of our organization is that it's nonpartisan and collaborative. Thank you. Diana, anything to add? I think the only thing I'd add to that is that um, in my community, the political differences were a big factor in terms of um, uh, in terms of how people behaved and what the expectations were of behavior, and uh, that certainly affected us in, in the the village boardroom um, more so, I think, than gender inequity or expectations around you know differences there. But I think what I did was put an emphasis on. I don't know if I'm saying this the right way, but celebrating differences or recognizing and respecting differences and actually using that as a a power play. Um, I would bring people together. I'd recognize that there were differences of opinion and differences of position. And I would actually encourage there to be a lot of dialogue around that. Um, It 
it created a coalition that was so strong that uh, uh, two individuals on my board uh, who belonged to the opposite political party were, um, were not endorsed by their own party when it came time for them to run again. Um, because, and I, I'm quoting their, 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 t the town chair, uh, who said they didn't give me a hard enough time in the boardroom. Um, so I endorsed them, which made my party mad at me. But you know what? I think that there should be a celebration of differences. And I think, uh, you know, that's, in my opinion, that's what's the biggest challenge about social media. People are uh, instead retreating to their corners and not welcoming um, debate, a healthy, respectful debate. And I think, you know, opportunities to to uh, to demonstrate that that is uh, a positive thing rather than a negative thing is is important. Well said. I'm going to bring Emma back into the conversation, Emma. We have just a short amount of time, but to do some questions. And, and before I turn it over, I want to thank Karen, Diana, Melina, and Mayor Parker for this engaging, empowering, inspiring conversation. So Emma, over to you. Yes, I just want to uh, echo Wendy. This has been so exciting to listen to. Um, and Wendy, thank you so much for uh, moderating this conversation. So we have a few questions uh, that have come in from our audience. And one is kind of expanding upon uh, kind of Diana, where you were just uh, talking about the the impact of social media. So um, would anyone like to kind of further share about how they think that social media has changed the way women are treated in the political field or possibly is a continuation of the same, you know, Karen, going back to your comment that Susanna's appearance was constantly uh, commented upon in newspapers well before social media existed. So, and I open that to the, to the floor. I, I mentioned this earlier. I do think it's changed things. And I don't see a solution right now. Um, I've even contemplated, you know, this, I don't know that you could really do this necessarily, but that you shouldn't be able to just be anonymous online and spout hate and divisive language. Your face and name should be attached to that because I think what's happened is we have dehumanized social media in a way that is not furthering our democracy at all. And it actually is pretty damaging and harmful and can be dangerous. We've had those experiences in Fort Worth. I've had those experiences that um, I think need to be taken seriously. Um, but on the positive side, I have seen the power to reach more people and get them engaged, especially in local government that felt really far away and maybe not even that important and utilizing social media um, to, to, to garner more support or input when needed from our community. So it's just a warning I'm heeding. And I think that women have a less tolerance for that more than men. Um, it bothers us more for some reason. You're subjected to unfair criticisms in a different way. And it's just something to, to, to be on guard about. Thank you so much for, for that answer, Mayor Parker. Um, and then I guess kind of shifting to another question, and you've all touched on this in some way, um, but another member of our audience was wondering, you know, related to this idea of shifting mindset, how do we ensure that the shift is occurring across a female demographic, right? That all women can get involved um, in, in politics, uh, the local level, uh, federal level. Um, so again, I put that question uh, on the floor uh, for, for all of you. I think it's like a landslide. I think the more young women see um, women in, in, in positions of influence, I think they'll see themselves and when they're thinking about their future. And uh, I think we'll see the shift happen more dramatically, more quickly as we uh, move it forward. That's why Melina, your First Amendment first vote is so important and so effective. Yes, thank you, uh, Diana, for that. And if I might add, one of the, the highlight features of First Amendment First Vote is what we call roundtable chats. 
So every time that the girls are together for a session, we invite current and former women in government elected or uh, in uh, position, governmental, professional government positions to have informal chats like in a round, uh, round robin sessions. And the, uh, the significance of that is girls come out of that and the adults and the, and the adult women come out of that just being inspired by the young and the young being wowed by the stories and the leadership stories and the pathways that women have gone through uh, to get to their positions. And um, Diana has been one of those women regularly that have participated with us. And it, it's, it, it's just a, a spectacular highlight of the program every time. And I just want to add, I think another way that we can do this is through the education system. I think more field trips to local government offices, more interaction with local leaders for students. Um, a good thing from social uh, or technology is that you like we're doing right now. You could Zoom um, a half an hour with a local leader and let the kids learn about their position. And again, I'm a big proponent of not just telling girl power stories to girls, but to everyone, so that every kid grows up believing that anyone can achieve. I think that's really important. Well, thank you all uh, so much for those inspiring answers. And we do have more questions coming in, but for uh, the purposes of time, because we are actually at time, and I know that we could all keep talking, but we are, uh, you are all very, very busy. So I want to be aware of that. So I just kind of wanted to end um, on a question. And Wendy, if, you, if you'd like to come back on screen, this uh, question can be for you too. If you could which, you know, kind of in a in a sentence, in kind of a short uh, a short response, summarize what you hope the main your main takeaway for our audience would be. So, what what would you, what do you hope that our audience's main takeaway is from this conversation? Um, and I'll start with Karen, and then we can go around the circle. I hope the main takeaway from this story is that we need to have more of this discussion. Is that we need to have more discussions like this, and that. You don't need to only log into something that an organization puts together in your community. You can engage in these conversations in a formal way and an informal way. And the more women are talking about the idea of leadership, hopefully like Diana has said, the more of a landslide effect we'll have. And also look to women in the past. This story tells us so much about who and where we are today. And she is not the only woman that had done that has done things that we can learn from. The past is contemporary in many instances, particularly in Susanna Salters. Thank you, Karen. Mayor Parker. So I think in closing, I would just say we have to hold each other accountable also um, in making sure that that we surround ourselves with the type of people that help encourage more leaders in the next generation. Um, it's so increasingly important. I think very apparent right now is in, especially in political leadership, passing of the torch, you know, who is next in line, who is prepared to be that next, you know, governor or state representative or Senator. And because the reality is men will always raise their hand and when will not, will not do that. And I feel a certain sense of responsibility right now of who am I surrounding myself with both on my staff and around me in the city so that they feel like they can serve in leadership roles in the future, whether it's tomorrow or 10 years from now. And that takes, as Diana and Melina can attest, it takes a lot of intention and it takes energy. And But we really have to do that moving forward. And then I'll also tout some help that United We has provided the City of Fort Worth and their appointments project is also looking down into boards and commissions and making sure you have more gender parity there, which the city of Fort Worth has needed a lot of help on as well. So I think all these things really do add up to help us be more successful. Thank you, Mayor Parker. Um, Melina? I have two takeaways, if, if you would indulge me first. Uh, hopefully everyone who's listening will remember that 
local, state, national elected office is the rightful place for 50% uh, representation by women. And the other takeaway is I do believe that every high school girl should have the opportunity and access to a program like First Amendment First Vote in this country to do exactly what all of us have been talking about on this call. Thank you, Melina. Wendy? I would say um, the key takeaway would be for women who are joining us or thinking about running for elected office, that we want to be the hand on the back to actually encourage you to do so. And if it's not you, then we encourage you to find another woman to run for elected office. And there's a role for women supporting women. And there's a role of women that we need more women supporting women candidates. Thank you. And finally, Diana. Well, I think to heed the advice uh, from all of these amazing uh, women that I've been blessed to spend some time with today. But the most important thing, it starts with asking, why not me? I think that's what the, what women need to do. Why not me? And I think that that is a, a wonderful kind of question to end today. Why not me? Why not any of us? Um, so thank you so much, Karen, Mayor Parker, Melina, Diana, and Wendy for uh, having this conversation today, for sharing your insights, for sharing your inspiration, and for hopefully uh, encouraging at least one person on this call to make that step and ask that question, why not me? And to our audience, thank you so much for joining us and for your questions in the q and um, Sorry we couldn't get to all of them, uh, but we really appreciate uh, your interaction and support. So everyone, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday. I hope it is a beautiful fall day wherever you are. And hopefully we'll see you again in another NWHM Presents. So goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much again. Thank you.